Getting into med school can be one of the hardest, most confusing, and most important things you do in your life. So today I'm going to be giving my advice to help you achieve this goal. Hey guys, if you're new here, my name is Daniel Gibbon, and I just graduated with an ATAR of 99.90 and UCAT of 3160. Getting me provisional entry into the UQ medical program with a 12k per year scholarship. And today I'm going to be telling you everything you need to know about how to get into med school here in Australia. There will be timestamps in the description below for all of the important points within this video. There are two main pathways into medical school here in Australia. The first is the undergraduate pathway where you are accepted into medical school upon your graduation from high school. There are two main types of undergraduate pathways. The first is the provisional acceptance into a medical program. And the second is the direct acceptance into the medical program. The direct acceptance is where you go directly into a medical course once you've graduated high school. Whereas the provisional program is where you're given provisional acceptance into a postgraduate medical course upon the completion of an undergraduate degree. There are a few key differences between the direct and the provisional entry into medical school. Firstly, the direct entry is usually a bit shorter, around five to six years, as you're just completing that medical degree. However, the provisional program is usually around six to seven years, as you're both completing an undergraduate degree and that postgraduate medical degree. Secondly, for the provisional pathway, you have to uh, maintain a certain standard to be able to continue to your postgraduate medical degree. This is usually the requirements of around a GPA of 5, where you have to maintain a GPA of 5 to be accepted to the postgraduate medical degree. However, this standard or the requirements for you to continue to the medical degree is usually very low and very easy to do, considering that you've already got into the provisional program. So it's usually not too big of an issue, however, it still is something to consider. Furthermore, with the provisional pathway, the undergraduate degree you do isn't always as relevant to your medical career. So sometimes you can find yourself learning a bit more useless knowledge to your subsequent medical career when you do the provisional pathway. And furthermore, since it does take usually a bit longer, it does also have a little bit of a cost uh, in terms of money, as not only do you have to pay for an extra year or two of university, but you also have that opportunity cost of losing those one to two years of medical experience. So because of these differences, it's usually seen best to uh, prioritize the direct entry course. However, some people do prefer the provisional entry as it can give them more freedom in their undergraduate, allowing them to explore different potential careers. As in my case, I actually chose the provisional program because it enables me to explore engineering as an undergraduate, as although it may not be immediately relevant to the medical uh, degree, it enables me to explore some of my other interests before I continue to uh, complete my medical postgraduate degree and continue to my medical career. There are a substantial number of universities which you can enter through this undergraduate pathway, including the University of Queensland, Griffith University, and Adelaide University, amongst many others. I'll put a list up on the screen here that you can look through and pause the video if you're interested. The second main pathway into medicine is the graduate entry pathway, in which people who have completed an undergraduate degree can then continue to complete a postgraduate medical course and then become a medical physician. This pathway is usually a bit longer and it follows a similar pathway to the provisional entry, which we described earlier, where you complete a, around a four year postgraduate course. I'll put a list of universities that offer graduate entry on the screen now and you can pause and read through it if you're interested. However, there's also a third, less conventional pathway into medicine in which you gain acceptance into medical school during your undergraduate degree after you've graduated from high school, but before you've actually completed that undergraduate degree. <clears throat> However, not many universities offer this pathway with there being severely limited seats for those universities that do, making this pathway very competitive. However, if you're very committed into trying to get into medical school, you should definitely look into this pathway as there is still a chance. Here is a quick table summarizing the universities that offer this pathway and then also shows the requirements for the pathway and then what the interview and course offers are based off alongside the number of seats available for people trying to get in through this pathway. And you can pause and review this if you're interested. 
So in conclusion, there are three main pathways into a medical program. First, you have the school leaver one, where you enter into the uh, degree straight from high school. Then next, you have the uh, undergraduate entry, where you enter into the medical program during your undergraduate degree. And finally, you have the postgraduate entry, where you enter into that program once you've completed your undergraduate degree. So now I've given an overview of the different pathways into medicine, and I've also shown you the requirements for the third and less conventional pathway into medicine. I'm now going to review what sort of requirements you need to get into the high school leavers and the postgraduate entry programs. The first thing that we need to look at is the high school subjects that you may need to take to get into medicine. As some universities have specific prerequisites that you need to be able to get an offer into the course. These prerequisites can be something such as math or sciences, with it often being chemistry being a requirement for some of these courses. However, it varies substantially between universities, and I'll put a list of prerequisites for all of the main universities on the screen now, which you can pause and read through if you're interested. However, even if a subject isn't a prerequisite, I would strongly recommend that you try and do the sciences in high school, because even if it isn't a prerequisite, it can be very helpful not only to know that knowledge for university and save you some time in university, potentially saving you from having to do a catch-up course in university, but it will also show if you really actually like science, because if you do choose to become a medical professional, you're going to be doing a substantial amount of scientific study throughout your career. So it may be helpful to do some scientific subjects to determine if you really do like science and, that's, and doing science in your career. So now let's look at what the actual offers to medical schools are based off. As the offers to medical schools are usually based off three main things. First, your academic results, so this could be your ATAR or your IB. Second, your UCAT results. And finally, your interview results. Some universities like JCU also base it off written applications as well. However, all the universities are a little bit different, as not all the universities use the same things to base their offers, with some universities like UQ basing it off all three, your ATAR or your academic results, your UCAT and your interview, whereas other universities like Griffith University only use your ATAR. And furthermore, even though most universities can use like your ATAR, your UCAT and your interview, the actual weighting of how much each of those matter towards the offer can vary quite substantially. As for example, places like UQ will weight your academic results as 25%, your UCAT as 25%, and then your interview as 50% for your final offer, whereas places like Western Australia will weight all of them equally. I'll put a list up of all the different weightings and all the different things that different universities use uh, to make those offers on the screen now, which you can go through and review if you're interested. However, it's not that simple, as not all applicants get an interview offer, and to actually be considered for an offer, you need to get that interview. As places like UQ can base that interview offer solely on your UCAT, so you need to perform well in your UCAT to even have a chance of getting into UQ. Whereas other places can base that interview offer on both your UCAT and your academic results. Occasionally, there are also a couple other written forms that you need to complete to actually complete your application. Because obviously, you do have to apply through the state, so through things like QTAC or VTAC or TISC, to those universities. But occasionally, you also have to do some extra written applications or give a form of a predicted ATAR as well. And I'll put a, a table showing all the different universities uh, that require you to do a little bit extra to actually get that offer. So as you can see, it's not as simple as just getting good academic results as you need to also perform well in your UCAT and your interview to be able to get into the med school that you may want to. So even if you got like a 99.95 ATAR or a top IB, you're not guaranteed into the medical program that you want and you need to be really vigilant on getting good marks in every single step in the process to be able to optimize your chances of getting into medical school. So now that I've given a rough overview of the different requirements and the different uh, things that your actual medical school offer is based off, I'll give a very rough kind of timeline of what to expect and what to be doing during the grade 12 uh, time. So firstly, in that summer holidays before you start grade 12, you kind of want to be doing all that UCAT prep and doing any of your written applications so you don't have to do in grade 12 and 
try and minimize all that stress of grade 12. And then you'll then have to uh, apply to actually sit the UCAT in the kind of early mid part of the year and you can check the exact dates on the UCAT website. And then finally you'll sit the UCAT in the, around the middle of the year uh, and then you'll have to actually finalize all your applications through TISC and uh, VTAC and QTAC and all of that, usually by around the end of September. Uh, and then you'll ha obviously have your end of year exams and your interview offers can uh, come at varying different times depending on the university. Some of them coming around November, uh, whereas other come later in the summer and it kind of just depends on the university. And then you'll sit those interviews at varying times in the holiday once you've completed grade 12. As with places like UQ, uh, they usually do it the week after you graduate. However, other places do it much later on and it really depends on the university. Now finally we can look at the uh, requirements and the things that they base your graduate pathway acceptance on. As your graduate pathway acceptance is usually based on your GPA, uh, your GAMSAT result and then finally your interview. However, once again it does vary between universities. Uh, with your interview offer usually being based on your GPA and your GAMSAT result and also similarly the weighting of those three different things can change depending on the universities. A common question that is asked is whether the high school lever pathway is easier than the graduate entry pathway. And what actually ends up happening is that the graduate entry pathway is usually considered to be quite a bit harder as not all universities actually offer that pathway, uh, leading to a smaller amount of seats or greater competition for that pathway. And then furthermore, it's quite hard to maintain those high GPAs in those undergraduate degrees. And also that GAMSAT is usually considered to be quite a bit harder than the UCAT. So it is usually considered to be hard to get in through that postgraduate entry. However, if you're in high school right now, what you should be doing is just focusing on trying to get that high school lever. But if you've already graduated or you failed to get in through that uh, pathway, then obviously all you have left is that postgraduate entry or that undergraduate entry that we mentioned before that was the less conventional path. And you just got to try your best to try and get through those. I'll pop a table up right now, which shows a rough estimate of the number of places for the different programs, uh, all the different pathways at the different universities, which you can pause and look through. So now I'll give an overview of the major parts of your medical application journey. I'll give some uh, advice or some information about some of the extra things that you may want to be considering along this pathway. The first thing is understanding the difference between a bonded and an unbonded medical placement. As when you're offered a uh, course uh, in medicine, this can be either bonded or unbonded. And if it's bonded, what it means is that you're required by the government to do around, around two to five years of rural placement within a, a quite a substantial amount of time once you've actually become a medical professional. And you can uh, Google it online to find the specifics, but it's actually quite lenient and it won't actually stop you from specializing too much. However, you will have to actually undertake some rural placement uh, once you have graduated. Whereas the unbonded program doesn't have any requirements from the government for any rural placement. So you want to preferably accept the unbonded positions to give you a little bit more freedom. Another thing to consider is whether you should be doing volunteering work. As volunteering work isn't strictly required for you to get into any medical program. However, it can be quite helpful along this process as it can help you develop a lot of skills which will be very useful for your interviews, helping you develop a lot of soft skills like communication and empathy, which will be invaluable and help you perform in those interviews, which can be very important in that application process. And they can also help you uh, in things such as the written application to JCU, as well as scholarship offers as well. So volunteering experience, although it's not strictly required to get into medical school, it can be very useful to undertake along your pathway to increase your chances of getting into medical school and also to just develop yourself as a person as a whole and also give back to the community. And you want to be doing this experience uh, as soon as possible and as much as possible, but obviously you don't want to be overwhelmed in grade 11 and 12 because there's going to be a lot of work that you're going to have to do. So it might be hard to do volunteering experiences during that time. So it may be preferable to try and do them in grade 9 and 10 if it's not already too late. 
The final question is whether you should take a gap year when you get a good ATAR but a bad UCAT which prevents you from getting into the medical school that you want. And this is actually quite an interesting uh, possibility as if you do get a bad UCAT which prevents you from getting into the medical school that you want then but you did actually get a good ATAR then what you can do is you can take a gap year and then redo the UCAT the following year and then reapply through the high school entry program. However, if you do then start university, you can no longer apply through the high school entry program and then only have that undergraduate or that uh, undergraduate pathway or that postgraduate pathway, which can be a bit more competitive. So this is something to consider if you do find yourself in a situation where you've got a good ATAR but not a good, good enough UCAT to actually get into the place or the medical school that you preferred. So that brings us to the end of the video. And if you found that useful, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a like. And uh, I've got a couple more videos about UCAT if you're interested and I'll be posting more videos about UCAT, ATAR and life and med school in general. Uh, and if you're interested in those topics, please subscribe uh, and uh, have a good day.